my name is Preeti Sampath and I'm part of the Free Bola Accent campaign. As we all know, there's been some really depressing news. On 24 December, he was uh, sentenced to life in prison. And uh, we all, many of us also know that this is part of an ongoing crisis in Chhattisgarh that uh, we've been also trying to highlight and, you know, kind of expose state abuses and human rights violations that uh, Ben Aixen has been trying to do. And uh, given the verdict on the 24th of December, we all felt that it was important. Of course, we organized immediately protests, but we also felt that it's important to have more awareness raising, uh, discussions, talk about this issue and try and come together and um, organize with more strategies. So this is part of an ongoing um, sort of campaign activity that we are trying to do. Um, we have the panel here, which uh, Vasuki will, Vasuki Nasia, who's um, law professor at NYU, is moderating. There's uh, Peter Rosenblum from Columbia University, Minakshi Ganguly from Human Rights Watch, and Somnath Mukherjee from the Free Ben Accent campaign. And, uh, Masuki will further introduce the panel and then the discussion will start. But before we started the discussion, we thought it might be useful to sort of um, see some of the context that we're talking about uh, through the photographs of uh, the journalist Javed Iqbal, who's been reporting on Chhattisgarh and human rights violations, not only in Chhattisgarh, but across the central heartlands of India, which are indigenous areas in Chhattisgarh, in Orissa, in Andhra Pradesh. He's currently in Orissa, actually. And there's been a, what he calls an encounter season over there, where the police has gone ahead and killed a lot of people. And uh, of course, the context of Chhattisgarh itself has a whole host of nuances. It is a BJP rule state. And as we all know, BJP has also been part of has, has perfected its technique of uh, violations and abuses and uh, its political agenda in Gujarat. And this is a different face of the BJP faced with an indigenous area, which is mineral and resource rich. At the same time, we have the Maoists who are uh, organizing in these areas and quite strongly organizing in these areas. We have, uh, uh, you know, centuries old living traditions of indigenous peoples over there living in these resource rich areas. We have the center and the operation Green Hunt uh, that uh, Chidambaram has really taken on as a personal battle. Um, and there is like a whole nuance of all of these issues in Chhattisgarh. So I won't say much more. I think let the photographs speak for themselves and let's see what's happening in the state. Um, This is Bastar in Chhattisgarh state. Is it clear? Oh, I'm sorry, we couldn't figure out the, the light switch over there. So we might have to just make you whatever's visible. Now this actually is in some of the villages, Takemargu and Gongkar, where uh, the CRPF, which is the Central Reserve Police Force, uh, came in on the pretext of uh, coming after the Maoists and uh, sort of uh, destroyed homes. But as Javed would say again and again, that it's not just the CRPF and the police forces, but also very often in the standoff between the Maoists and the, and the police forces, even the Maoists also have indulged in violence and destruction. So these are destroyed homes of the people from villages in Tatemargu and Gompar. People are coming back to see the ruins of what has happened after a CRPF attack.
This is the internally displaced person settlement in Andhra Pradesh. These are the ruins. Uh, that's burnt rice and uh, families have lost rice for over like two years of kept rice, saved rice, which they could use for replanting. seven years of produce burnt by the police forces. This was uh, an encounter, a fake encounter, in which three young men were picked up and then killed. This was a person accompanying them, and these were the dead bodies returned. Uh, there was a wedding going on in the village when the news of this encounter came and then the people in the village, the family members, this is the father of one of the men who was killed, one of the, and all of them gathered and started walking towards the police station to reclaim the bodies. Uh, these are people mourning and walking from the wedding procession straight to recover the bodies. This public hearing was organized by Himanshu Kumar from the Vanvasi Chetna Ashram, a Gandhian group working in the area for several years. These are the two people who went missing afterwards. Uh, this little boy had lost his fingers in the attack. And both him and his father have disappeared. Um, the third person on our title, Kopa Kunjum, was one of the people who was actually part of this writ petition, and uh, he has been framed under charges of murder and arrested, and has been in prison for, I think, about two years now.
this is where the bodies were exhumed from, the nine people who died in the attack on Gompad. And Colin Gonzalez, who was actually defending the case, also uh, claimed that uh, the evidence had been tampered with, the evidence of the attack. And uh, Kasuri, could you just turn on the lights, please? So, just like to turn it over to you. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, we'll, um, the, the, we'll go straight into um, the presentations of our speakers. Um, they'll each speak for about um, 15 minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Um, and I'll introduce them in advance so we don't break the flow of the conversation um, as we um, as they speak, um, and in the in the order that they will go. So for um, Somnath Mukherjee, who um, is uh, with the Association for India's Development and has been involved in the Benny Aksen campaign um, since early 2008, um, and uh, and with a series of other campaigns with the Association for India's uh, uh, Indian Development um, for um, for several years, for over eight years, uh, issues around agriculture. Um, he's also been involved with the international campaign for justice in Bhopal, um, and he has a, a lot of experience with um, a range of different grassroots groups um, in India. Um, then Minakshi Ganguly, who is a South Asia Director for Human Rights Watch, and um, in that capacity has um, uh, researched a whole range of different issues from the Gujarat riots to issues around the lack of justice in Punjab, uh, issues around uh, religious minorities, human rights issues in Jammu and Kashmir, um, and um, including the failure to protect India's vulnerable communities um, in areas affected by the Maoist conflict. Um, and finally, uh, Peter Rosenblum, who's uh, a professor of human rights at Columbia, uh, and came to Columbia from Harvard, where he was associate director of the um, of the human rights program there. Um, and before that, uh, Peter had a lot of experience outside of academia in a range of different positions, uh, working for the predecessor of the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, uh, working for as program director for the um, International Human Rights Law Group, um, and but also with the Human Rights Watch um, and the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. Um, so with those very brief um, introductions that um, I'll turn it over to, to Samnath. Thank Thanks, Vasuki. Um, so I'll, I'll just start with a sampling of uh, media stories that appeared in today, to, uh, the media stories that appeared today over, you know, several newspapers in India on, on Chhattisgarh. It's not a random sampling, but um, in a couple of stories. The first one is that 25 people were injured and over 100 detained over a protest that turned violent where people were protesting against the land acquisition for a thermal power plant in Janjgi district. Second one was that the Chhattisgarh government scrapped an elephant reserve in favor of a coal mining uh, company in Korba district. The third is, uh, although an older story, but you know, which was published today in in the Hindu, that uh, a village in the district of Surguja woke up in March 2010 to find that their village had been turned into a city, in the sense that uh, a, a gram panchayat was converted to an urban municipality without the consultation of any of these people uh, and uh, not even the sarpanch of the panchayat. So this is just a very you know brief snapshot of what how things are going on in, in Chhattisgarh and all these three districts that I mentioned are not even the so-called disturbed districts. This, uh, this, this falls in the northern part of Chhattisgarh. So uh, you can well imagine how things are in the southern part of Chhattisgarh, which has been marked as you know um, Maoist infested district or um, yeah, disturbed uh, districts. And this is not just today. You know, stories like this started way before even uh, in the prelude to the making of the state of Chhattisgarh in 1998, when uh, a woman by the name of Satyabhama died of hunger strike on her 10th day because she was protesting against the privatization of the river Shionath. And Chhattisgarh happens to be the only state which has been selling rivers left and right to private companies. 
depriving villagers on either sides of irrigation, of drinking water, of everyday necessities, and wholesale giving the rights of water of those rivers to corporations or conglomerates who would then uh, divert it or use it for supplying the hundreds of other uh, steel plants, thermal power plants, uh, mining, uh, mining equipment plants that are uh, uh, coming up. So, so th what I am getting to is that the government in Chhattisgarh had launched on this aggressive uh, industrialization policy and if you go through their written policy also it's quite clear their uh, nature of aggressiveness and I think they have signed over 150 MOUs with uh, companies all over the world none of which is accessible to the public. In the last few months alone, they have signed about 33 MOUs with power plants to set up. Uh, as as uh, Preeti was saying, Chhattisgarh is very rich in mineral resources, has a vast uh, uh, forest cover, and uh, of course, which means uh, lots of natural resources uh, uh, to be had. So, uh, and I think their, uh, their target is to reach an, uh, uh, an investment of um, 10 trillion dollars or something in that magnitude I don't even know how many zeros that is but by 2013 they are supposed to reach a target of uh, 10 trillion US dollars of which they have reached I think about 40 billion uh, so far so the pace has you know they are you know even increasing the pace uh, even now but the problem is that uh, all these land acqu acquisitions that need to happen in Chhattisgarh to set up all these industries and mine the um, uh, mine the minerals underneath is that the most of the land there is protected under Schedule 5 of the Indian Constitution in, in tribal uh, tribal majority areas uh, you know the Constitution of India gives them special uh, privilege so that they are not alienated from their land because they live so close to the land so how, how was how was how are they going to deal with uh, this issue of so many tribals living in uh, you know, so so many, um, so so much of the mineral rich um, areas, and what was happening uh, with uh, with the, in parallel was you know the severe discontent was uh, giving the the Maoist movement a good foothold amongst the larger uh, uh, rural uh, population, and this um, so some sometimes people say you know the Maoists have been exploiting uh, the people, but I'm not sure if the Maoists have been exploiting the people or the people are riding on the back of the Maoists because the the, the tribals of this part of India had a history of rebellions long before Mao Zedong was born. Uh, you know, so one of the first rebellions against the British were, were armed rebellions happened uh, happened in these uh, uh, bands of. Uh, uh, of the uh, forest, but anyway, the Maoist movement was g uh, gaining hold, and it was becoming even more difficult for the state to, um, you know, acquire, expropriate these natural resources. And <clears throat> the state's response to the Maoist movement was further militarization, bringing in hundreds and thousands of uh, troops of paramilitary forces, and uh, building up the paramilitary forces to the level that uh, India has in Kashmir right now. Chhattisgarh is at a very comparable level. About uh, uh, last 2009 alone, I think the Home Ministry said they were going to put in 70,000 paramilitary forces for Operation Green Hunt. And before that, of course, there was a big build-up of CRPF and Naga battalions who are known to be brutal and um, disconnected from the local uh, um, culture. So, th so the, uh, the state's response was uh, militarized, and not just militarization, but specifically militarization of the civil society, where uh, a vigilante-type movement was brought up by the name of Salva Judum, and uh, you know people were armed to fight the Maoists. And of course, there was no scruples in in who ge who gets arms, how they behave, what what is the code of conduct or none of that but these were you know almost cheap hired guns who would go to the front and 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 the, and um, you know and and the um, state forces would uh, uh, follow them um, so when when the government of india's planning commission came out with a report called uh, development in um, extremist affected areas in that they even the government themselves said the people themselves said that uh, the Naxalite movement has to be recognized as a political movement with a strong base amongst the landless and the poor peasantry. 
So, uh, but obviously the government uh, completely ignored uh, this dimension of it and treating it as a military problem. They increased the military strength, which further fueled the conflict and, you know, both sides uh, started swelling. And there was huge number of, uh, uh, you know, human rights violation and... Uh, um, uh, so, so the Salva Judam, in fact, was used to actually abandon, uh, force people out of villages into roadside camps. So uh, there were about uh, 650 villages which were vacated in this manner, and some, of course, they left uh, on their own accord, fearing uh, violence. Half of these people are perhaps still living in the forest. No one knows where. And about 50 or 70,000 people are living in the northern part of Andhra Pradesh in refugee camps where they have no access to uh, drinking water or food or education or any of the basic uh, necessities. And um, so this was the this was the background, um, you know, what was going on. And in 2005, uh, Dr. Binayaksen, as the state secretary of uh, PUCL. Uh, People's Union of Civil Liberties, um, um, you know, they conducted a fact-finding mission in which, so till that time in 2005, it was heralded in the media that Salva Judam is a peaceful, spontaneous Gandhian movement. But when he, uh, he, uh, with the fact-finding report, he blew the whistle on it, basically saying it is not a peaceful, not a spontaneous <coughs> movement. It is a state-backed state vigilante armed movement. And he documented the violence of it. He, he clearly also documented the violence of the Maoists and, uh, and, and said that it is the violence of the Maoists that, that gets reported and exaggerated in the newspapers and the media, but the human rights violations being caused by the security forces are nowhere to be heard of. The, and, and uh, you know, so he made that public and, you know, earned the wrath of the government ever since. And on false charges, he was arrested in 2007, and the trial dragged on in a silly manner till 20, uh, December 24th, when he was convicted for life on completely trumped-up charges. And you know, it, it's uh, it's just silly if you read through the charges and how the proceedings uh, went. And Binayaksen is only one person, but there are hundreds of others who are languishing in jail in 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 Chhattisgarh without trial. Um, um, you know, on pretext like there isn't enough police escort to take them to court, so they don't get a chance to see the, uh, you know, the lights in court. Um, uh, another name mentioned on the poster you must have seen, Kartam Joga, who is one of the petitioners on a PIL, a Public Interest Litigation in Supreme Court of India, challenging the constitutionality of uh, Salva Judum and special police officers. Uh, Himangshu Kumar was mentioned. He was a Gandhian who was running an ashram, basic doing you know standard uh, developmental work. But once he started raising his voice against Salwa Judam and government policies, he was hounded out. Suddenly, the government found that he is in violation of some land laws, and uh, uh, his ashram was surrounded one day and completely raised to the rubble with uh, you know 500 CRPF uh, jawans surrounding him. So he was forced to leave Chhattisgarh. Uh, Kopa Kunjam, Suknath, these were people who used to work with him, work with the rehabilitation of uh, the refugees who had run away into, Ch into Andhra Pradesh. They, were, uh, they have been booked under false uh, murder cases and also are languishing in jail without proper trial. Um, so all these, um, uh, not all of these, but a, a large number of these people are booked under a special act in Chhattisgarh called uh, CSPSA, Chhattisgarh Special Public Security Act, which is a draconian law that gives very broad powers to the state to say, you know, who is illegal, what is association. Uh, it, it verges on thought crimes that basically you cannot even think of something and you, you could be held guilty for thinking a certain way of uh, carrying literature. Um, you know, if some literature is found in your house, you might be liable to be spending two years in jail. Um, so uh, they have been increasingly using these law excuse me, uh, these laws, uh, Chhattisgarh Special Power, uh, Special Public Security Act, UAPA, Unlawful Association of uh, 
prevention activities, something like that. And and of the latest one is the sedition law, of course, under which uh, Dr. Binayakson was uh, convicted, saying he's waging a war against the uh, state of India. Um, the Supreme Court itself has very clear, uh, clearly noted in a 1962 case that this sedition law infringes on the uh, used, uh, if, it, if it is used standalone, it, it can uh, infringe on the fundamental right to uh, free speech. Uh, but uh, of course, those, those were things lost upon the state and the, and the judiciary. And uh, so any, any voice in Chhattisgarh today, including that of free, um, of journalists, of free media, of uh, researchers is being uh, snubbed out. If they can get their hands on them, they're being put in jail or hounded out of uh, uh, Chhattisgarh. So this is what uh, the movement that we are all involved in is uh, asking for, is the repealing of such draconian laws which give such broad powers to the state uh, and uh, infringes upon fundamental rights guaranteed by the Constitution of India. Uh, revoking, uh, you know, such uh, m the convictions of uh, Dr. Binayak Sen uh, um, till a re-hearing is done in the Supreme Court or the High Court and disbanding uh, this um, uh, the civilian the civilian militias that have been formed the supreme court uh, so things slowly go up to the supreme court in 2 3 4 years and by the you know by the time supreme court says something and it trickles back down and that's punishment enough for a person to uh, go through so the 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 procedure the judicial procedure itself has become punitive um so Chhattisgarh, the Supreme Court had also asked the Chhattisgarh uh, government to roll back on Salwa Judam. So now they officially say they roll, have rolled back on Salwa Judam, but they have given rise to something else by the name of Mahadante Shwari Swabhiman Manch, who, which is threatening uh, journalists and researchers who try to uh, go there. So. Um, so this is uh, this is the situation in Chhattisgarh, and uh, you know my, the, uh, any democratic space is fast vanishing, and uh, we have to raise our voices to uh, keep those uh, democratic spaces alive or recreate them, and uh, you know not not let a state become uh, you know state be able to act with uh, such impunity. So that's all I have to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's horrible weather outside, so thank you all for coming. Um, Somnath has actually covered much of the ground um, of what uh, the situation is. I'll briefly tell you about how I first met or first encountered Binayak. And actually, Binayak, in a, in a number of ways, is the is the sort of internal struggles that 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 is India today. He kind of represents almost all of it. So India that and India that 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 all, a lot of you read about most often in your papers is the India with the great economy, with the tycoons, with the 21-story residents. You know all of these sort of grand things, um, and that's really the India that that that, that internationally has become uh, become the one that is talked about, and it's great except that. What is not happening with that, and it's 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 wonderful that all of this is happening. I mean, you know, to, to India. But what is what is unfortunate is that India India has become somewhat in a hurry, so they are almost embarrassed about their own poor, and if the poor complain or the un, under or the ones the the disempowered complain, that has become a bit of a bad news and an embarrassment that should not be highlighted, and that is the unfortunate story of what's going on in India today. In that. Binayak is crucial because Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand are two states that are new, new states in India. They were, they were cut off from previous states purely because these were areas that were not very well administered. They were sort of hanging on to bigger states. Once they became states, therefore, the civil society presence in these areas was very, very limited. You know, they, in, India has groups that do a lot of work, but these two areas, because they were so far away, did not have that many groups uh, operating there. So the importance of being Binayak, because Binayak Sen was working in Bastar where no one, including the police, ever went. Bina, you know, 
to to get a water pump or, a, or you know just the hand pump in a village in in, in a village in Dantewara district was really hard because the district officials will tell you oh the villagers have hamlets which are three or four house, houses and to just service three or four houses is too much work so let me not give the water pump so in that area there, there was this man who was who was working and he uh, therefore was able to inform the rest of us a, a, quite early on on some of the things that were going on in Chhattisgarh as um, India began to plan its great progress and had to start mining and had to build the infrastructure and, and basically had to find, play, you know, people had to move people out to build the, build the, build the economy. Um, when I first spoke to Chhattisgarh, uh, to Binayak, it was about the law that you just mentioned with the Ch Ch Chhattisgarh uh, Public Safety Act, which in fact is the one he was eventually detained under. We first started talk to, talking to him about that. Then, of course, the Salva Judum stuff started up. And the Salva Judum, you know, uh, Somnath has described it in detail, but just to understand the principle of what the Salva Judum was, basically it was empty the pond to catch the fish. Empty out the villages, whoever remains is automatically a Maoist or a Maoist sympathizer or complicit in the movement. And therefore, village after village was told, either you're going to move out of this village or the state government is going to, the state is going to come back and say, you're all Maoists and therefore you're fair game. And that, the horror of, of people who have lived in somewhere for centuries, suddenly, first of all, being told that they don't have a choice. Leave your cows, leave your chicken, Forget your homes. You're now going to be schlepped off and live on the highway in these constructed uh, row houses with, with tin roofs um, was, was horrible in itself. But then, of course, they used the, the, the members of the Salva Judo movement to go out and burn their homes just to make sure that they didn't go back. So the whole, the whole really, the evilness of this plan, this, they, you know, just let's, let's, let's get you out. Is the is what when we first started working? What we what what we uh, the title of our report was called was was basically that we did not have the right to be neutral. These villagers had no choice. Either they were be Salvojidum or they were assumed to be Maoist. So, in that situation, again the importance of Binayak Singh. No one else was talking about it. So Binayak was the first one who raised his voice on this, and that is why the Chhattisgarh government got so upset with him. When we first started working in Chhattisgarh. When we would meet the police, they would tell us, oh, but you should not, you should not work there because, you know, everyone that's working there is a Maoist. So you will get wrong information. We don't think you're bad, but, you know, you, you're going to get really wrong information because these people are all Maoists. They're all, you know, front organizations, uh, uh, front, yeah, front organizations for Maoists. We did our work um, taking great care not to, to work with a multiplicity of groups just because we figured that, you know, the credi our credibility would always be in question. Mm -hmm. When we first brought it back to Home Ministry, uh, really it was this bizarre meeting. It was a previous Home Minister, and he sat behind this table, which was an empty table. He's the Home Minister of India, but it was this really large empty table. And we sat like supplicants on the other side, and he leaned back in his chair, and he said, so, tell me, what do you want? And so we launched earnestly into our findings and so on. And um, he said, if there has been any wrong done, it will be addressed. And we were like, <laughs> right. So, you know, I know that a lot of people are unhappy with the way the Indian government is responding now, but the truth is that this government has at least acknowledged that Salva Jibdum was a bad idea. And it pretty much had to do that because of activism that started with Bin Ayak Sen, was picked up with other people who had, have had the courage to file the civil suit in the Supreme Court, have ended up in jail because of it, but the courage of a number of people who have done this work and brought it to the point where, where it entered really the mainstream media who started talking about how awful the Salva Jutum plan was. Um, the other reason why Binayak Sen is so important, I mean, and I'm talking about the, symbol, the symbolism of Binayak Sen, is there were two very prominent people who have been accused of sedition recently. There was Arundhati Roy and there was Binayak Sen. Now, what happens with Arundhati Roy? Another government cannot figure out what to do about it. They're unhappy, but they also understand that, you know, people have the freedom to express their views and would and decide not to do, not to, not to prosecute her. They do not file charges. It goes to a court and the court orders that there, there should be an attempt to file um, sedition charges. As opposed to Vinayak Sen's case, where he's accused of a slew of things, you know, waging war upon the state, 
plotting, conspiracy, overturning the Indian government, all these, all these things, none of those charges stand up in court. None of them. Including the fact that the most basic thing that he was accused of, which is ferrying messages from, from a jail, from an imprisoned Maoist leader to, to his commanders, except that the jail authorities quite rightly said, yes, it, it was under our supervision, because otherwise the jail authorities look pretty bad. That, you know, this, this person who's coming in as a medical and aid work, legal aid worker is carrying these messages, the jail authorities know nothing about it. I mean, the whole thing, but what does the court then choose to do? You know, they don't get him on anything else. They give him life imprisonment for on, on sedition grounds. Now, it also in a way reflects where India is today. The, the, the way that the, the, the Indian state responded to an Arundhati Roy versus a, versus a Binayak Sen, the, the reluctance to go to, to, to try and prosecute Arundhati and the, and the glee with which he was, this, this Binayak was given life imprisonment. And this, this difference is something that is going to come up more and more as we look at what, how the states are going to respond to the Maoist uh, challenge because there are a number of state governments involved. Each of those state governments are responsible for law and order in their own states. They get federal forces from, in terms of the CRPF, but the actual operations are done under the guidance of the chief minister of each state. And how a chief minister decides to pursue it is going to make a lot of difference to what happens to, to the people whose homes can either be burnt or not. And we've seen some of this happening. Chhattisgarh has, of course, witnessed the ugliest of these responses. We've seen that, uh, for instance, in Bihar, it has been a little, little more uh, considered. Uh, you know, it's 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 going to be interesting where this heads. But what for for uh, for human rights groups like us, that you know, we we carry on talking about what happens to the people. You know, once again, are you going to be? left with no choice to be neutral because, you know, if Binayak, who has international stature, has people who are grouping up like this in New York and talking about him, if he can be put away, then how are we even going to monitor the situation? Who is going to talk? Who is going to tell these stories? And at, at which point will Javed be taken away? You know, the, 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 the amount of intimidation that this case has, that, 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 that is a result of this, of this conviction is enormous. Because yes, we, we hope, I mean, I remember when, when, when the case, when the, uh, when the verdict was going to come out, I, I messaged Elena, uh, Binak's wife, saying good luck. And she, you know, none of us expected it. You know, it, th there is no way that it, this, this could have happened. But if it happened to Benayak, what happens to everybody else? Am I ever going to go and work with a local group again? Because, you know, if I then put out a press release based on information they've given to me, is he going to go to jail? Will we never see this person again? The challenges are just enormous in terms of what the state response is going to be in, in this situation. And at the same time, also, and this also should not be f forgotten because I think we have now, as human rights workers, been we become uh, almost it's become like a sort of thing that you have to say. So let me say it as well: the Maoists commit a lot of abuses. They are a nasty group. They kill people. They, there is no reason why some policeman should lose should be should have his throat slit by the Maoists, and they do it. They blow up schools. They recruit children. All of them are crimes. And uh, you know, it is not that we do not criticize it. But the power of the state and the accountability of a state is much, much more. And therefore, when we speak for the state, we, we expect them to do better. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I actually am saying this in the conclusion of my thing because this is something that comes back to us all the time. You never criticize the Maoists. Of course we criticize the Maoists, but they're the Maoists. You know, you know you're the state. So, so really, I mean, so, so yeah, I mean, that's, so, so thank you all for, for, for doing this for Benayak because it is not just for Benayak. It is actually for all the other people, all these people who are now working in these, in these areas who are at such grave danger. Of, of disappearing, of, of being killed in a faked encounter, of being tortured, of being arrested, of being given the life sentence. Thank you. So I'm going to be mostly an echo chamber, I think, from the, uh, from the international side. I'm here more out of solidarity than out of special knowledge. But I think for, um, for those of us who have tried to follow uh, human rights and the evolution of, of, the, of the conflicts in India, it, we're often um, caught in the dilemmas that Menakshi was describing of the 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 the, the, the modern um, news version of India and the Ambani mansion. 
versus the uh, versus some of the events within the country, and and even among sophisticated commentators on India, the judiciary continues to have a kind of credibility and legitimacy beyond other parts of the Indian government. And so even if we know that there are problems in India, we tend to think that, well, when it gets to the courts, there will be positive correction of some kind. And, and again, those of us who are lawyers and, and law faculty have looked to the Indian courts as a model for many different um, many different kinds of, of intervention in society and an ability to respond. And so it's, 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 it's complicated often to then to, to look beyond and to, to, to think about, to, to even understand how one reacts in a, in a setting like this. I think the, um, it's, it's been very hard to, uh, to negotiate the, um, the, the fine line of, of, of analyzing the human rights issues without being caught in a kind of simplistic um, analysis of conflict, at conflicting sides at, at war, or, or alternatively, at times to be caught up in a kind of romanticism as well of the, of the natives and the, and the Maoists, and, and we see that kind of writing also. So um, any of us can look online and we can look at the case, which there's now a translation of the judgment into English, and there have been various analyses on, on blogs and in the press of the case itself. And so I would only be um, repeating what Menakshi said to say that it seems a kind of, it seems an, an, you know, an obvious travesty, a kind of caricature in terms of the ways that evidence were treated. I, I think that you know, maybe it just bears saying that, that, uh, that, that a lot of the practices are practices we're seeing throughout India in, at various times in, in, the, in the high courts and in lower tribunals that the kinds of, of flimsy uses of evidence or the, the, that despite the, the, the knowledge that torture, that encounter killings, that, that violations of basic rules of evidence are common currency, that there's still a kind of faith in the outcome or faith in the justice that somehow it will cleanse that and, and result in something that has been more purified. And, and it's, it's important to, to, to recognize that that's not happening in, in many parts of India and certainly not within that judgment. I guess I, I think what Menakshi seems to be saying, that it's, it's, it's lucky that there's a Benayak Sen and in some ways lucky that there's a judgment like this that has gotten such a, 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 a widespread condemnation from Indian lawyers from across a spectrum that it's hard to take the judgment seriously and that's a good thing because there are so many other circumstances of violations in India that aren't getting that kind of attention that escape the, uh, the, the lens of of human rights. Um, I'll leave it at that. I'll just, there was just one other point that I thought also worth, worth noting, which is um, the, what's happening in Chhattisgarh, what's happening in Jharkhand, what's happening in, in, in other parts of India in, in, in different ways, even Karnataka or places where there's a, a land grab of sorts going on, is, that is, is, a, is, is actually part of a worldwide phenomenon where there's a new scarcity in terms of land and resources that is driving up land values and land prices around the world and leading to a kind of rapaciousness that I think we'll see more people pushed off their lands in new kinds of ways in a trend that we've seen from the past and that this is one, uh, one hideous example of. But you know, thank, thank, thank God for, uh, for Benai Xen and for the standing up in this case and for a judgment that we can focus on and see in kind of black and white the, uh, the travesties. Thanks, Peter. Um, thank you to all the panelists. We'll open up for discussion. I did a paper about 30, literally 30 years ago, 35 years ago on the Max Life, and it's amazing to me that the situation is, you know, shall we say the same or has to be resolved today. So my question is, if this is implicated in what we see, the things have gotten worse, not simply or you see it also as a political trend of the political parties having become 
worse in the last 20 or 30 years and even more corrupt than they were, despite India's, quote, democracy. <laughs> it's flawed, isn't it? I mean, the whole dem democratic model is flawed. There's the same people. 30 years ago, they were the same people. Um, except, you know, I mean, it's funny. I, I, I can talk about 15 years ago when I used to go to some of these villages and I would find the, you know, the, the children not in school and the, and the homes in the state that they were in. And actually, I go back and find exactly the same hard, mud hut, the same child not in school. Quite often, the, there are two differences. One is there is usually a TV in the village. And, and otherwise, and a lot of them have cell phones. So, so uh, aspirationally, India has changed a bit because clearly they want the cell phone uh, over sending their child to school. Um, but beyond that, as a state response, I think the difference is the, the embarrassment, the turning the eye away from the, from the, from the, from the marginalized, which is occurring in India today. I find the, uh, that you know, when we do our work now, the middle classes don't want to be depressed. They don't want this news. You know, that, that's the problem. You know, it's, not, it's the same people. It's just that they don't want to, they don't want to think about it. Hi. Um, so my question is, I, just in conversations that I've had with my family um, and other people that I know, um, and not that they have a particular political affiliation or anything, but a lot of people, I think, see some of these repressive policies and um, uh, stamping out of dissent and things like that as sort of necessary security measures. Um, I think that there are a lot of parallels between political opinion as it ranges across the political spectrum here. And so I'm just wondering if you have any strategies or tools that we can use to reframe um, the message and, and uh, you know, put it in, in a context that doesn't turn people off and actually encourages people to want to know more and to actually question or critique the information that they might be getting from their news sources. I, I don't know how to, you know, repackage this exactly. Um, uh, rather than, I mean, except for saying that, uh, you know, the the perspective of the poor have to be brought out. How does India look like from a tribal's point of view who has been driven away from his or her land? You know, what does it mean for a mother who has no access to the judicial system of India or can get any protection from the police in India or can approach any government officer in, in the Indian system. So uh, this perspective needs to be brought out. And, you know, uh, and, and because th this is one voice we are never, uh, we, are, we do not hear. And, and there is, of course, a problem of representation of, of, you know, so many people trying to represent the poor in India in their own, own very fine ways. But, but you know, how do, how do we get to a society where these voices are heard and, and these people also have the equal access to, you know, the so-called uh, uh, democratic institutions of, of India? Um, that is one thing, and uh, the other thing I, I would say is, which which uh, which is the point that Binayak Sen's case makes, is why so many people feel about Binayak Sen and, and uh, not so much about Kopa Kunjam, because with Binayak Sen there is a fear it could be me, you know, but I, I will never be Kopa Kunjam. So, so it is this uh, this bringing it closer to people's uh, you know you know minds and bodies that it could be you it it could be any one of us. I mean, it, I'm not speaking out today because I'm fine, but uh, you know if I speak out, I could be Vinayak Sen or I could be uh, Kopa Kunjam. You know, it doesn't I, it, it it doesn't necessarily take you far, but there's a certain moment when to your parents or to others when you say. But, but, but they took him to court and here's what they did. They, they convicted him on the basis of, a, of, a, of an unsigned printout that, um, that wasn't in the evidence that they, that they represented when they first seized the evidence. That it's so, that isn't this a horrible thing that's happening to our justice system that it's required to bend so far over to make things up 
in order to put this man away, and, and what did he do? Something's obviously wrong. So I, I think you can only play those stories out so far, but I think that is, that's, the, that's part of the, what you're so not saying about this man being sort of, he could be, he could be us, yeah. he could be you. But there's also just the logic of, of uh, prevention, isn't it? I mean, to many conservative people who, I mean, and I get this all the time because we work so much in Kashmir, uh, is, you know, you should not have, if you do not put these people away, they will be, they will commit violent acts. And the logic of the human rights uh, argument is that if you do not protect their rights, that's a likely a way in reason for them to be drawn to commit violent responses. So, you know, a logic of peace often works quite quite a bit also with, with, with folks because at the end of the day a lot of people are not evil. I mean, you know, the average middle class in India is not is not they're not bad people. They just don't they just don't think that, you know, they want to be content in their own contentness. They, you know, they want to watch their, they, they want to have their lives, they don't want, they think of everybody else as troublemakers because life is sorted for them. But life is not sorted for them because it is, it's, it's really on the periphery of their lives there are grave uh, risks to their own securities that, that do exist. You know, a Bombay happened. And if, if, they, if a Bombay happened, the answer is not to punish every Muslim or go to war with Pakistan, but the answer is to prevent Bombay from happening again. And you know that that requires a certain amount of justice to be delivered. It was brought up in the Swiss Parliament. Was it? Wow. Yes, uh, there was this group that wants Switzerland to be totally unarmed. And um, when I, I mean, I was trying to find the money trail to this because uh, previously the Salvadoran members were getting fifteen hundred rupees a month. Now it's I think three thousand. So uh, if you consider the number of guns that were bought, I, I was just thinking maybe 2,000 or 5,000, I don't know how many. And there was this money that is paid, and it's not paid by the Chhattisgarh government. It's apparently coming from the central government. I was coming up at least $5 million or more. I mean, that's a very basic amount. So uh, firstly, I couldn't find, I mean, I tried to do a lot of questions, but I couldn't find any reference on how the, uh, I mean, how did you know that the guns were coming from Switzerland? Has there been any follow-up? Has there been any follow-up on, you know, who's funding this, or can that be, you know, in any way brought accountable? Like, if the central government is somehow, you know, putting this money in a, in some unknown account mm -hmm. and and paying for this. You know, I don't really know. I don't know what the. Uh, we, I don't think we followed up with the Swiss, Swiss governments, so I don't know how the funding is happening. But the way it comes, the way that this this whole thing is operated, is that the again there, there, there's a, there is a difference in views in how this is going to be handled, right? So in the in the Del, in in Delhi, at the central government level, what is what what is promoted is a development and security twin policy to try and handle the issue, basically saying that these people have been denied the, their rights, their, their economic rights and social rights, and therefore they, they, there has to be some amount of state, um, um, state uh, response to that. And the money that goes in quite often is directed at that development pot. Uh, and then the, the security pot is largely giving off the paramilitary, the, the paramilitary forces that are raised. Uh, I would imagine the SPOs are actually paid from the Chhattisgarh government budget because they will come under the police, the Chhattisgarh police. Uh, uh, well, uh, the, um, I mean, th that, that could be true. But I know that the guns, uh, it wasn't paid by the um, Chhattisgarh government from so it came from the central government? I don't know. I, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> this, uh, I actually, I went to... I went to, with Kopa Kunjam to some of the villages last year before uh, Himanshu Kumar had to leave. Mm. And just now I came from India, I went to some of the IDP camps there. Mm. So I, uh, I mean, I tried to follow up um, on, on what is going on there. But uh, from whoever I asked, whoever worked on this issue, they said that the guns, uh, I asked Himanshu Kumar mm. actually last year when I went, I asked him about the guns, where did the guns come from? And he said that, you know, Chhattisgarh government wasn't paying for this. So this is coming from the center. Mm. And so, um, and, uh, and regarding the uh, Salvajudum payments, uh, well, uh, that is true. It must, be, must have been the state government because uh, after Bina Aksen, um exposed this, the state had to uh, back down and say Salvajudum is illegal. Uh, the Supreme Court said that the state cannot arm its own people, and that, that was the biggest crime of Bina Aksen. True. So, 
and also because the Salva Jirum was using children. The, some of the SP, well, not Salva, Salva Jirum was an entire movement. Of, of, from the Salva Jirum, some people were selected to become special police officers. And these special police officers, because the security forces had never worked in these areas, I mean, really, I mean, the government presence in these areas is invisible. So, so even to walk in these areas or, or try and figure out, uh, you know, how to catch the fish once the pond had been emptied, they still had to go in, enter the pond, I suppose. And the way that they did that was they hired, uh, they hired Salva Judum members as special police officers who were paid initially 2,000 rupees and I think it was probably raised later. They were given a three-month training and a large number of them were underage. Uh, when we first started working on this issue, actually, it, we, one of the things that we looked at was the fact that these people uh, looked young. You know, it's very hard to tell the age. And the Chhattisgarh government's response, in fact, was also that tribals look young. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but, you know, some were clearly, you know, you know pre-puberty, so they were, they were, they were <laughs> so, so then the, then the then Chhattisgarh police actually had to um, weed out uh, some of these uh, people from the from the forces from the SPOs. Um, I haven't actually followed up on whether they actually did it. We, the last we knew, they were in the process of doing it. They had these little forms, and people had to write out and bring their tenth class um, certificates to figure out the age. But it was going on at that point. Hi, my name is Sandhya, and thank you very much to all of the panelists for coming and discussing such a, an important issue. Um, we haven't talked very much about um, the involvement of the international community tonight. Um, and my question is actually that I had noticed that the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights Defenders is currently on a tour in India, and I believe she's doing a five-state tour, and one of the states that she's visiting is, is Jammu and Kashmir. And I was just wondering if there was any um, push from civil society to have her visit either Chhattisgarh or Jharkhand. Um, I know that she is also coming at the invitation of the Indian government, so it might be a little bit complicated, but I wonder if you could just um, speak a bit on whether or not there is any movement to get her to Chhattisgarh. I thought you said um, no, there was a poor, I mean, you know, so I was, uh, you know, we were obviously told that she was coming and we tried to, uh, uh, to try and list the places that we wanted her to go. Uh, I, I wanted her to go to Manipur to meet with Om Sharmila because one of our campaigns is the repeal of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act and we wanted her to meet with uh, Sharmila. Uh, we did want her to go to Chhattisgarh. Um, but then uh, what happens is Himangshu, whose who's, uh, ashram has been uh, broken, is in Delhi. So I think one of the decisions was that since he is in Delhi, he will get to meet with her and be able to talk about it. And eventually, I don't know, her office made the final schedule. But yes, we, we, we I had listed... Um, Chhattisgarh, I had listed Gujarat as well, so so we had we'd, we'd put together a number of uh, places that we would have wanted her to go, but uh, but I still think it's good that she's going to Kashmir. Can can you say something more, Minakshi, about advocacy? It's really always a delicate question: is how one advocates on on Indian human rights issues, and and even where the 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 critical leverage points are at this moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, oftentimes. I think now we've seen much more kind of a, a transnational advocacy of, of South Asians around the world often speaking in a way that's um, maybe it looks at least more legitimate than governments in other countries trying to take positions. There's some places where the U.S. I was actually quite pleased to learn that the U.S. ambassador still refuses, to, does not meet with, with Narendra Modi, that there are certain lines that aren't crossed. <laughs> But I don't know where otherwise a country like the United States has a useful role to play in something like this. Um, sorry, Manakshi, could you just speak into the mic because we can't hear? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, now? Um, it is a challenge. I mean, uh, it's a challenge for a number of reasons. Once, one, because of India's own pushback. India is now in a position... Uh, uh, globally, where it can push back when these things happen, it's quite, it's quite. Um, and the other is also uh, just uh, it's like China. India is now, now, uh, now a market. So a lot of countries want to do business in India, and they do not really want to upset the government in question. So uh, both ways, there, there is a, there is a, uh, there is a challenge to this. Um, one of the things that is important is India doesn't like, like the. Uh, the ill repute, the, the criticism, they, they don't take very well to it. Um, and in the government, there are enough people still that probably would respond in a, in a way where they might 
uh, how do I say this, you know, might, might be more positive than the others. I mean, to a large part, you know, the people are uh, like your, your parents, just, you know, why are these people making trouble? But then there are a, there are a number of others who, who did, do get sometimes upset. And that's, that's perhaps the domestic lobby that we try and, um, try and set up. But internationally, it's much harder. It's, 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 uh, it's difficult. Uh, I think the threat works better. The fact that when these things get ugly, we are going to speak at the human rights commissions. We are going to, you know, that that threat works. But that that they don't want that happening. Um, they let you know him, they let me work there, but that's because I'm an Indian national. Okay. They they if if I were a foreign national from Human Rights Watch talking about something as sensitive as Kashmir, I think the pushback would have been much more. There is a certain amount of. Uh, certain amount of just my having been a journalist for so long and they know that I know the situation quite a bit and I'm unlikely to be completely crazy about what I'm saying. Uh, that does uh, help. But that's also tenuous. I mean, I think everyone who does this work, it's tenuous. At which point someone's going to upset is anyone's guess and then we are all, as I said today in my office, plucking lice of our, ourselves in jail. So, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, it's hard to tell. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Can I sort of follow up to that? Are there been, have there been areas where international advocacy has worked? Kashmir, usually Kashmir, usually behind. Um, uh, so in the new world of, 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 you know, we call it the name, shame, engage model. It's the human rights uh, way of doing things. And usually it was always name and shame, and, you know, you kind of get response. Now engage is the sort of the, the, the mantra that everybody follows. And engage is a model that works uh, in, in India because India follows that model. So it, if... We will never get in the Indians, for instance, to ever publicly criticize something as horrible as happened in Sri Lanka, where, you know, a government announces a no-fire zone and then proceeds to shell its own civilians. You know, India would not take a public position. But, what, you know, you'd, they would say we are privately telling them, this sort of engage model of things. So that same engagement we sometimes try and use um, also with, with the EU or with the U.S. Uh, to try and... Uh, try and talk about it. Basically, I, and I, I, you know, at the bottom line, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't even, I can't talk like Peter in legal terms. I can only talk about logic. You know, at the end of the day, if you have a bunch of very, very angry people whose rights have been abused, they're going to become abusive themselves. You do not want that happening. So just that logic sometimes works, particularly in a context of Kashmir, where you do know that a lot of a uh, lot of things that are also exaggerated, but a lot of the truthful accounts of abuses that occur in Kashmir are uh, motivating factors for other people that join, uh, that choose the violent option. So just for that reason, I think the, the engagement uh, factor does work in those things. I, I wonder, I mean, not to, just to, following just a tiny bit, I mean, the, whether the vanity of, of judges can be, can be played in any way on this, because I know, I mean, I always thought one of the brilliant pieces in the uh, 377 campaign was, to bring common law, gay common law judges to India or high, you know, high stature judges to whom Indian judges obviously defer. And I wonder whether in this case, I mean, there's, there's more of a kind of gentle advocacy through the legal system of a, of a kind of, of conveying the international embarrassment of international jurists. But I, I don't know if that's... It's a, it's a thought. I mean, you know, the thing with the, you know, at, at some level, the two things that largely works for for the average human rights worker are the, is the media and the and and the judiciary. You know, I mean, in a in a broad way, that's roughly if it if 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 they are on your side, things work. Um, but what has happened of late is the same, and I and I I can't even explain this sort of this this sense of of from being the poor Indian that, you know, every kid was told to you know, finish their food because some kid in India was starving, from there to have now reached the place where they have is a source of immense pride to Indians, including judges. So, you know, it's, this, it's the same after, you know, they're human beings, they, they, it's the same, it's the same. And you, I mean, you know, whether it's, whether it's some questionable judgments like this or even cases where we found terror suspects who will say that, They've been tortured, or, or, or you know, was the co confession coerced? Questions that an average magistrate is supposed to ask and act upon, we find that is not happening because you know, uh, one of the some of the things that we've been doing post uh, is 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 a group called Indian Mujahideen, 
and what the Indian police did there was that they, fi they filed multiple charges. So it's the same conspiracy, you know, three bombs go off in a particular city, uh, conducted by, according to the police, by that same one group, and however what happens is that they will file three different uh, police cases. So the, uh, for every, every case, uh, police, police gets 15 days custody. If they're filing three different ones, that means automatically 45 days of custody in police. Um, when these people are produced in court, because they know they're going to be returned to the same police, they can't always talk about torture. It's up to the magistrate then to ensure or ask if these people have been tortured in custody, whether they fear something. But, you know, we don't, so even these standard practices and protections, so it's not even, you know, forget the judgments, it's even these things that, that should happen. But at the same time, there, there is an activist side to the Indian judiciary, which has often uh, been, has, has been of, of great relief. Uh, the Gujarat cases, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, Best Bakery case was moved out of, uh, uh, um, and, and, and so was the, uh, the Bilkis case. They were moved out of, of, of Gujarat. So there, there have also been positive, uh, positive uh, things that have come from the judges. And I agree, if, if we can get them a little more uh, motivated, certainly to have ex-judges criticize some of these judgments would be, would be, a, huge, would be a huge step. Um, I actually had a question, and I wanted to ask all of you to think about this, perhaps, and try and shed some light on this, because it seems that um, the manner with which the Salva Jurum or the Mahadateshwari Swabhiman Manch <clears throat> has been created has some parallels with the special police officers that were, uh, you know, the, the special, whatever, police positions that were created in Gujarat. So in terms of the BJP and its political agenda and its utter arrogance with which it thinks it can get away with, you know, this kind of gross, you know, viol violence and violations, and the arrogance with which it assumes that a court which is under a BJP rule state can actually, you know, we can all, anybody with the least semblance of logic who looks through the proceedings of the case or the charges can actually see how fabricated it is. Um, the evidence is completely fabricated. So, I mean, there seems to be also some kind of sense in trying to see this also as a BJP political kind of agenda coming together with also the whole neoliberal thrust of, you know, Modi inviting the Tatas over and this whole kind of resource-rich area and clearing it all up. Maybe not just about turning away from the misery of the poor, but as but kind of really repressing it and silencing it in a much more kind of arrogant manner uh, with utter impunity. So, I mean, what are those kinds of parallels? And uh, to Somnath, I also wanted to ask uh, after this as a follow-up uh, in terms of uh, the kinds of strategies and actions that are being thought of from here about, you know, the Free Ben and campaign. But first, this, this question about the political agenda to all of you and kind of parallels. Well, let me just start with the follow-up. So, um, with the free uh, Binayak Sen uh, campaign, actually more, I would say, international advocacy at the at the level of you know either grassroots or or um, you know citizens advocacy has had some effect. Uh, however, mild uh, it it will not be decision changing, but it does have some uh, some effect. One uh, one angle that used to play uh, very well on the Indian administration was the NRI angle. So if an NRI is calling saying, what's going on, why are, you know, shots being fired at the villagers in Rewa, and they would sit up and, you know, pick up the phone and, like, you know, try to, you know, sound official and try to placate you or something. So th that, that angle is slowly losing its edge with the rising prosperity also. So, so you are NRI, big deal, and they'll keep the phone down. <laughs> so that has ha happened over the last five uh, or six years, but it's not completely uh, lost. So one of the strategies is to, uh, you know, suddenly bring to light uh, at a very grassroots level, uh, you know, exposing them to the international ar arena or making them feel like that you are actually exposed to the, uh, you know. So if you, because of the advent of these uh, cell phones, 
you know, everyone has a phone now and you can actually call up every police station in India or or it be every, you know, district magistrate or... So there was one time when Himangshu Kumar was actually whisked away into a village and uh, and he was under the control of the Salvajudam people and we all got together and made calls to the district magistrate and the superintendent of police and whether it had an effect or not, it's, it's hard to say but they did respond uh, to so that that is one angle that does play at at the grassroots in india not not probably not at so much at the decision making but it helps to build some pressure uh, and we have seen that also in in bhopal you know where like hundreds of people from us and europe start calling all the officials in in bhopal and and then they sit up and take notice or turn off their phones whatever um, so, so some of the you know strategies um, has been that uh, is that highlighting Binayak's case, of course, but not forgetting about you know Kartam Joga and Kopa Kunjam and and Suknath, and use this opportunity to bring to bring to light uh, that there are hundreds of um, others who are um, you know languishing in the jails. Um, the other thing we have been doing this this time is actually keeping very good synchronization with the movements in India so that, uh, you know, the representation is the same, the message is the same. So in, in certain ways, let, let globalization also work for the poor and the weak and not just the rich. Um, so that, that has been working uh, quite well and January 30th has been decided as the Global Day of Action and people all over are protesting on the same day. Um, in 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 Europe, in India, in the in the U.S., and that that I think uh, you know gives a strong message. Uh, so when on the on the uh, so timing timing is a big thing. How you know how it is portrayed out in the media, and media also becomes interested in such a at least the manner of which sees pretty widespread and well coordinated. So they take cognizance of that. So on the 24th, when uh, you know Vinayak was uh, convicted, convicted, we in Boston got together in within a few hours and held a protest in Harvard Square, and that got covered widely in the media because it was done in very short time. And um, so we had just said it was a protest in Harvard Square, and media just inserted the wor word. A protest in prestigious Harvard School. Yeah. <laughs> so those kind of things are, you know, could be cheap tricks, but they do, um, you know, have a role to play. We also had a protest in New York City on the yeah. 30th. And yeah. yeah. Right. Um, I just was interested in, in your attitude, um, your opinion, uh, because we're talking a lot about the complicity of the middle class with these kind of new... Uh, neoliberal kind of impulses that are behind a lot of this violence. Um, but about the increasing and shocking complicity of the Indian mainstream news media uh, with uh, petty bourgeois, bourgeois opinion making, complicity with the state, uh, and which is, I'm thinking, the first level of frustration uh, that anyone that's interested in change encounters. Because this is linked again with culture of silence, with uh, lack of information, without which you cannot have opinion building. Uh, so that, and another institution that I'm curious to hear your opinion about, uh, the NHRC. Because um, Preeti talked about like the BJP and Shaw. We understand uh, the BJP's violent politics, but there's also been long pending cases with the NHRC under Congress regimes, the 80s uh, anti-Sikh Punjab terrorist uh, um, genocides, mass disappearances, killings. Um, just wanted to hear some opinions on these institutions. Right. Um Actually, to go back to your uh, original question, which kind of feeds into yours as well. Uh, you know, political color doesn't really alter that much the functioning of a state. Yes, one group might be more nationalist than the other, but by and large, the state response inevitably is nationalist. And that's the, that's the spin they put on it. Um, so, yes, we can, we can perhaps argue that a, a non-BJP government in Chhattisgarh would have been less repressive, but we have no idea. Because, you know, the whole plan was probably done by bureaucrats who will 
remain. I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't know for for a fact. But I know, I see why you're saying what you're saying. I, you know, but I'm just saying that do not let the others on no. the hook. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to clarify the the point is my point of raising that was not to say that uh, another government would be less repressive, but to actually see if we can actually see parallels in the political agenda and strategizing of BJP also, and identify that as a clear strand mm -hmm. in in some ways in terms of the neoliberal. Um, you know, whatever, attracting uh, corporations, attracting uh, development, mining of a particular kind of nature and industrialization of a particular kind of nature, while at the same time kind of creating this repressive politics. I don't know. I mean, in terms of, I wasn't kind of trying to say that another government would be better or worse or anything of that sort. Of course, we all know the whole history of Congress and the OGH is entirely, you know, uh, Chidambaram back. Uh, but I was just trying to see in terms of the political no, you're right. trust yeah. of... No, and right. no let, uh, the thing is that, you know, uh, a nationalist political party seeks legitimacy of doing these kind of things because they have their, that's their, that's their uh, identity after all. It is a nationalist identity. But in, in a state response quite often, even if it's not couched in that nationalist identity, is to push back. You know, the, the silencing of dissent can happen regardless. It's just that one group has the polit political legitimacy to continue it. I often don't know which one is, whether, whether uh, someone that has that nationalist agenda and therefore you clearly know what they stand for is better or to have a benign, non-performing state be better. I, I, you know, it's, it's hard to tell because it's, it's much, it, in a way, it's also difficult for, for, for people like us to go into an office and be told, you're absolutely right. That is a very bad thing that happened. And then, okay, fine, she's gone, let's have some tea. You know, I don't know if that, is that going to be a better way? Because, you know, do lives change? So I do, but yes, it, certainly the nationalist agenda perpetuates hate in a way that the, not, that the others don't. So what, what I'm saying is that they, they legitimize a certain amount of hate. So a, a Binayak Sen conversation where he will be then clubbed as a Maoist or a terrorist or whatever else they might want to describe that would, would become much more legitimized when the govern, government of the day is someone that is spinning that same, uh, same discourse. So to that extent, it is, it is, it is dangerous what, why, why that happens, particularly true in Gujarat where you describe this because the number of people that have been killed in Gujarat apparently plotting the assassination of, political leaders, of the political leadership is incredible. You know, they, 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 all these people who were clearly incompetent at it as well because they kept getting picked up and being shot by the, you know, so, so there is, but again, the discourse is that, right? I mean, it's, it, it justifies, it justifies these deaths, which were, which were illegal killings by, by framing it in that nationalist agenda of, of, of security and so on and, and, and finds legitimacy in that constituency. So, which is why uh, it's, it's, it's scary and frightening, but in terms of state response, I think the state response is just by and large tends towards abuse. Um, the National Human Rights Commission it has been extremely, extremely disappointing, increasingly so um, as we, uh, in, in recent years. Um, also, don't forget there are state human rights commissions. Mm -hmm. And I, if, if, so in terms of international advocacy, every diplomat I meet, I tell them, please, when you visit state capitals, go to the State Human Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the India at, 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 at the Human Rights Council during its UPR hearings will always say, oh, we have the National Human Rights Commission. That, that is their answer to, to all, all allegations of human rights abuse. And uh, clearly, well, they have two answers, and both of them have now been shut to hell. One was the State Human Rights Commission, the, the Human Rights Commissions, and the other is the Vibrant Civil Society. Well, Vibrant Civil Society is in is serving in jail life sentence and the state human rights <laughs> commissions unfortunately are often just a single room operation with nothing available to them they are a, they are they are a joke and and it's it's a disgrace that uh, you know the world's largest democracy that claims it by boasting about these institutions provides no assistance to them does not empower them in any way and has in a way almost uh, uh, restricted them. The National Human Rights Commission was great after the Gujarat riots. Justice J.S. Verma did have, was one of the main voices at that point of time to deliver justice. But since then, we've seen it gradually becoming less and less um, um, uh, powerful. Bob, could you say a word about the press and whether, as between the English language and other language press, there's a big difference? Because obviously, I mean, we're seeing a lot of good reporting, at least around the judgment, in mm -hmm. the English language press. So. 
is there can you do you have a sense of what's happening otherwise it's a this the press in a large way reflects reflects its own audience really you know i mean so we have we have media that is that that Chhattisgarh media, for instance, will probably still be calling Binayak a, a, a criminal of some sort because that's that's where they belong. Um, the mainstream media that you ask so, so to answer your question is mixed. But at the at the English at the English language national media level, by and large, we find that when it becomes an obvious case of of of, of something something terrible that happens, they do speak up. But it's not their priority. Those are not the cases that are being. Those are not issues that are regularly in the Indian papers. You know, more often there are uh, issues of uh, of trade, of stock market collapsing or or soaring. All of those are often um, often more newsworthy. But even so, the media has we, we I mean you know has still been often uh, where we would go. You know, just because I think in terms, India still is it's a democracy enough to respond to public opinion. So it's a democracy enough that knows it has to go back and seek those votes. And to that extent, when, uh, when there's uproar, uh, you know, when the media informs the people, there are often people that do get agitated. There is a pushback and there are all these SMSs and, you know, tweets and, and, and so on. So then there... Uh, we find that the state does respond a bit. So we do need that media. We, but but as, as, as uh, Somnath said, you know, what also matters is the prestigious Harvard protest. What matters is the blogs. I mean, these are all new media things. What happens is YouTube and people watch this stuff. And, you know, people, so we, we also as activists, we are grappling with how we are going to create our own forms of communication as opposed to using the intermediary of the mainstream media, which after all, is is uh, beholden to the same advertisers that are probably investing in the mines. So you know, so we have to also find other ways to communicate. And and some of these, some of these, uh, so some some of the multimedia projects have been pretty strong in those. Yeah, I mean, I think what I was specifically referring to is the witch hunting that certain media personnel are carried out. Wherein you can actually create a demon out of an international <coughs> celebrity like Arundhati Roy, who's middle class, who's a face of an India shining, she could have been uh, if she'd only kept shut. Uh, so when you can put a person of that kind of stature and an attractive female to boot, um, and also with an active participation of particular kind of uh, broadcast and media personnel, uh, that's definitely worrying. I think Hindu has been an exception. I, I would say Hindu of late has been, uh, you know, carried not not just Binayak Sen, but you know stories like this uh, of you know this uh, village turning into a city overnight and and such stories. A couple of journalists have um, done quite uh, well, I would say, in the English media. And uh, regarding the um, NHRC, the National Human Rights Commission, uh, particularly in Chhattisgarh, has been very, very disappointing, the report they wrote. Uh, I think the team was comprised of 10 police officers or something like that, you know, going to investigate the crimes perpetrated by the police. So on the get-go, it was flawed. Um, and then they, you know, obviously they were afraid, so they went in the villages with huge, you know, armored vehicles and gun totting people, you know, even more intimidating and asking rape victims publicly, were you raped? You know, such a very shoddy, uh, very shoddy report. And, and in one point in the report, they even actually confessed that, uh, you know, we were going with this large CRPF battalion to a village and these villagers ran away. We, we never understood why that why that <laughs> happened, you know. So that, that was their level of unprofessionalism um, of this report. Yeah, they have been very, very disappointing. There was a question in the back. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, I level against the human rights and civil rights groups. Uh, especially when it comes to they defending the state against the uh, you know oppression versus when the Naxalites kill the BSF army jawan and you know so on and so forth. There's a you know good chunk of people outside this room who strongly believe that. And for us to actually fight this kind of a battle against a central government or a you know central uh, or the state governments, we need all those people to be on our side. You know, because if, if on January 30th, if all these people come out on the streets and have a protest, it's going to 
get a lot of media attention, but how do we change this perception? You know, how, how do human rights or civil rights groups defend themselves? <laughs> you you missed my speech. <laughs> um, no, we do, we do. Uh, you want to do the IHL too? Um, okay, so there are, yes, there are, there are, so there are different, there are different, let me unpack this. Does, is it wrong for a policeman to be abducted and held to ransom and killed, which happened in Bihar recently? It's wrong, completely wrong. But if there is a group of Maoists with guns and, and a group of soldiers with guns operating against each other and one group dies over the other, you know, we as human rights workers do not comment any more than we would comment if 76 Maoists were killed in a fair fight. You know, if, if it's a fair, if it's between these two groups, we talk about the civilians, therefore. Are you, you know, are, what is happening to the civilians in these villages? But, 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 you know, of course it's terrible when any human rights, life is lost, including that, that of a BSF man who is some poor guy from some, some you know, uh, village. But, but that, I, I will actually respond to it even more strongly. In Chhattisgarh, um, 76 people were killed, 75 CRPF men and one uh, SPO uh, police officer. And the, the reason that they died was entirely the fault of the, of the government of the, play, of, the, of the day. Because what were they doing? What they were doing is what they called, you know, they were, they were getting into holding operations. So they were trying to get into areas that are controlled by the Maoists and holding them and reclaiming their, them as state-held places. Any such security operation requires a certain basic minimum of security that is provided to the forces. But what these guys were doing was they, and, and standard rules, for instance, uh, when you are in a Maoist area, quite often, because the Maoists do use children as informers and use civilians as, as, as informers, these villagers will go back and say that there is, a, there is a group of soldiers going a particular route. So standard procedure is you do not come back that same route because they will have pl planted a mine in there. So that standard procedure was not followed in this. Those guys came back the same route. They did not secure higher areas. Now these are standard operating procedures. The state did not put them in place. So yes, it was terrible that those people died. And they, did, they died because those operating procedures were not in place. But in, in the larger cause of why uh, human rights groups do not uh, mourn the passing of security forces, we do, but so does the state. But when a civilian is killed, you know, it's only us making a racket about it. You know, those, those people who are killed wrongly are not wrapped in the Indian flag and, and born of an honor. They are, they are described as criminals. Their bodies are left, as Javed's picture just showed, lying in their underwear. So, you know, those are the people we do speak for, just because no one else does. Well, you know, we've, we've got a whole report out on, on how the Maoists are blowing up schools and therefore uh, denying children access to education. There's a whole report out there. The Maoists hate us for it. And they keep claiming that they only blow up these schools because security forces use them for, for shelter, which is not true. They blow them up because they symbolize the Indian state. And it's, it is terribly wrong of them to do it, and we say it. We, so, you know, it's, it's just that people who want to be unhappy about this will only spot one end of the, on the, of the criticism and not the other. So, yeah. both sides. Yeah. Just one quick announcement that we are going to go on till 8.30. I know the poster said 8 o'clock, but we have a room to do longer and since there, there is interest. And I asked a question for both um, Niakshi and Samnath, which is, um, oh, sure. I had a question, um, basically, you know, parallel to the, have the, you know, obligatory and or otherwise uh, the critique of uh, uh, human rights violations by non-state actors. I wonder whether there are also two other things that are standard moves, and I say this partly because of you know, it's part of the um, culture of human rights, both of uh, rights advocacy um, in Sri Lanka, but also perhaps um, in the U.S., and I wonder whether the same thing is true in India and for your organizations as well, that you have to also um, repudiate violence and that you also have to um, claim allegiance to the state, I mean, make some patriotic noises. I mean, are those, are those also necessary gestures or gestures that your organizations or the groups you work with to have to do? I mean, I suppose to, you might as well not necessarily patriotism, but whether the violence, so both on the violence issue and the politics of violence as a legitimating factor in, in, in uh, nationalism. So, 
sorry. Uh, just a quick announcement before people leave uh, was that we are having the NYC protest on the 28th. Uh, the flyer for that is right there, so please make sure that you're there in order to protest outside the Indian consulate. And sign the postcards. And sign the posters and the postcards on your way out. That would be really helpful. Yeah, so, um, uh, yes, I think it's a very necessary step of <clears throat> uh, condemning violence as, as, as a method of uh, any groups that owe allegiance to violence, we cannot, you know, support that. And we have, um, you know, repudiated violence in all its form and not just physical violence but also the structural violence which forces the Adivasis of uh, Chhattisgarh to have a body mass index, index uh, below 18 or, you know, suffering from chronic uh, malnourishment and tuberculosis. So we, we see that also as a form of structural violence and uh, we have uh, we have categorically uh, condemned the violence of the Maoists of the state um, and and every group, but in terms of making patriotic noises, I don't think we have done that, and that might be a good strategy to what he was claiming to get the other, uh, you know, other side of the people who are uh, so careful of the human right wallas as they are called now. <laughs> um, but we have not done that so far. No, I wasn't advocating for it. Yeah, I, was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just asking, because it does also seems that violence is also works as sort of a limit category within the Human Rights Committee, and I was wanting to actually put that up for discussion as yeah. perhaps a problematic limit category in some cases, but anyway. Right. But abuses are. See, we, we, will, we will say abuses are. So we, we, we have a classic, you know, we sort of tied up by the law, and we will say abuses by, by either side. So it has to be a legal abuse. Mm -hmm. So recruitment of children is that kind of thing. So we will we will follow that pattern. We will uh, torture by the Maoists is uh, uh, the the kangaroo courts. We will call kangaroo courts. We will not say the legitimate. So those it's it's sorry. Uh, I was saying that uh, we do not take a position on the violence as a human rights group. But what we would do is we would comment on the abuses on human rights abuses by a non-state actor as well. So indiscriminate bombing that will kill civilians, uh, torture, uh, arbitrary uh, abductions, all, all, all the sort of, all the things that, that fall into the category of an abuse we would, we would comment upon, but not on the, we will not, uh, um, we will not need to say that we therefore condemn the violence or a vi the choice of violence as such, that we don't do. Um, but do people need to do that? I mean, I, I don't think we win this one, Watsuki. I mean, you know, for years we said the LTT was horrible, right? And then when we started talking about the Sri Lankan government's response, Sri Lankan government would have loved us all those years when we said the LTT was committing all the crimes, turned around and, and you know, pretty much chased us out of their country. So, so you know, I don't think it matters what, what, how much objectivity you do claim to because we, we try very hard to be balanced about this but whichever side is is under attack always feels that they are the ones under attack and we are uh, unfair to them. So, um, Both neoliberalism and majoritarianism feed into each other and so on or whether any, any of those issues but your, your last uh, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I do think you know a lot of this issue in specifically in Chhattisgarh is being fueled uh, by the current economic system of uh, you know of of the um, the capital uh, you know the global capital or Indian capital which is uh, quite difficult to delineate right now but you know them being desperate to find sockets where they can gain fully reap benefits and uh, so so there is what Peter was referring to you know a, a global uh, push to not just acquire natural resources but also to uh, you know this find these sockets where you can go and build these apartment buildings which would need air conditioning and which would need heating and whether or not people live in it or whether or not it goes to serve the majority of the population of India is besides the point. But there is this, uh, this desperation in this capital to find 
such socket. So let us build up this place, you know, let us dig up that place, let us, let us get bauxite out of there and ship it out of out to China where they can store it for their future, but let us get it, get it out of the ground. Um, you know, you know, th things like that, you know, let, let us get into the market, uh, let us turn all this, you know, 1.2 billion Indians into real, uh, you know, high, <laughs> high uh, high efficiency consumers so all of these uh, these i i feel all of these uh, uh, forces definitely are playing into why chhattisgarh is chhattisgarh today or why jharkhand jharkhand is you know is jharkhand uh, today so there is a, there is that one level definitely uh, i think for everyone in the world to recognize that factor because everyone is a consumer so you know just you know like the the ipads that we are using and making obsolete by the year the macbooks the you know where are these all this material coming from you know the gold the lithium the this the that you know it is coming from somewhere it is you know there are chhattisgars all over the world so in that way i think it is it is a moral imperative for everyone who has a good material life to think about it and you know not play into this game of obsolescence and uh, you know we, like environmentally ecologically politically socially in all ways that we can uh, think of can i put out just like the room is thin so there're probably not many of us left but who would who would respond to this but I would just say, work, since I work on natural resource issues around the world and mineral issues, that far less is actually known about India than many other parts of the world when it comes to those issues that you've raised. And in fact, we don't know very much about what's really happening economically in Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh. And you read some pieces that are really upsetting, actually. You know, I've been holding back, but that Arundhati Roy piece, which really romanticized the, the conflict and comments on the economic investors in a sort of distant way of seeing a sign of Vedanta and of this and that. But in terms of serious work on what's happening and where the minerals are going or what's being used, it isn't there. And it's in part because India has been outside of the international campaigning around these issues, most of which have focused on foreign capital investments. But there's a lot less known. I think we, it would be really valuable to learn more and to, and to figure out ways for those of us who are doing economic work or resource work to focus in more detail to flesh out exactly those issues that you're describing so meaningful work can be done because the moment it, 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 it can't be we don't have the data yeah because there isn't any penetration into those areas also and you know all these so-called Maoist uh, area dominated areas are actually congruent with the mineral rich areas of right. India. But I can tell you a lot about what happens with, uh, with, with tin mining in eastern Congo but I can't tell you very much about the same issues right. when it comes to um, right. tribal India. Yeah. yeah. No, you're right. I, I, and a large part of it is also because these are areas hard to get to and therefore not only of illegal mining or labor laws or child labor that's being, you know, all kinds of things that might be going on there. No one really knows very much about it because it's, a, it's just geographically a difficult area to work in. So people haven't, that's, that, I suspect that's part of the reason. And part of it, of course, is just uh, for a long time, all of this was state-owned. So, you know, uh, the mining business was state-owned uh, and therefore people didn't look at it because it wasn't relevant. But now that private businesses are involved in these sectors, there needs to be more more scrutiny. But that's only, you know, five, six years, and people just haven't gotten around to, to doing a lot more. Yeah, there is one, one example, though, uh, of recent, very small example of uh, this group around POSCO in, um, in, uh, in Orissa that, you know, they, they have been fighting. So there's a very strong ground resistance there. But what also happened is an international group of, you know, scholars and activists got together and built bridges with the movement, and they actually came out with a report which trashed the economic analysis on which the whole project was based, you know, saying that this will actually going to uh, benefit the people in the area who are anyways well off from the land they are reaping. So this, they, they completely shattered the whole baseline of why this POSCO plant needs to be built there. So such work needs to happen a lot more. Yeah. Um, I think also but the 
part of it is also that in the past five years, especially these policies have become far more aggressive, like with the Special Economic Zones Act and several other industrial estates and other kinds of zones that are being created. It's become like extremely like these flashpoints are really emerging in the past five years. Uh, Siddharth has just come from Orissa, actually, and I think also from the POSCO area. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I did get to the POSCO villages and, you know, it's surrounded. But uh, one thing that it, it was happening in Orissa, where Javed is right now, in uh, Kond Mahal, which is uh, western Orissa, which is bordering Chhattisgarh, it is a heavily um, tribal population. And so there are a lot of these encounter killings have taken place in Jajpur and, and such places. But in POSCO, which is uh, this 51,000 crore rupee, yeah, uh, 51,000 crore rupee, um, uh, it's a it's a project. It's not a mining project. In this case, it's it's a steel plant, and they'll be shipping the steel to Pohang Steel, which is a Korean. There are a lot of these false cases, and this is uh, in West Bengal also, where there are farmers uh, and uh, you know villagers. It's slightly more advanced than tribals. There are say 140 false cases, and uh, the person who I'm uh, who. Uh, first took me into the village, he had just got out of jail the, uh, day earlier, and the person I was staying with, he had to leave at 3 o'clock in the morning to get bail in one case, but they tried to arrest him in another case. You know, you, that is, that's a way of putting several cases, that's what he had mentioned. So uh, it seems a multi-pronged way of doing things. Like if it's, if it's a poor and tribal person, you know, uh, eliminate that person. And if it's a slightly person who cannot be, uh, you know, more organized, then these, uh, the judiciary seems to be really focused on... Uh, uh, in basically crippling them, and that way bring bring down the resistance. So, can something be done about the judiciary or like yes? We we just talked about the judiciary a little earlier. Just trying to one of the things that Peter suggested was getting the ICJ to look at it, and I think that's a good idea. Maybe we should we should pursue that. I'll talk to International that. Commission of yeah, Jurists, yeah, ICJ, yeah. exactly with retired judges yes. and others, because there's there is such a marvelous vanity in the uh, Indian judiciary of responding to common law, significant common law judges from other countries and playing in that field and being included in that company. So it's a great idea. I'll, I'll contact my colleagues now and ask them to. <laughs> I, I actually have a technical question about how the lower courts can actually give this kind of a judgment with such... I mean, how do they even come up with this kind of a framing, how do they get away with this whole complete lack of due process and well, that's why this law what, where is the accountability exist? in the lower courts? I mean, it's, it's a genuine technical well, question. That's why this law should not exist. That's what we said. Because, you know, it's, it's all very well to have, as, as Sobhanath said, the 62 judgment from the Supreme Court saying that as long as it does not lead to an incitement to violence, it cannot be used. But the point is, as long as the law exists, that's where the law needs to go. You know, that's the whole point. The, the law just needs to go because it can be uh, misread by some judge or the other. So that's, that's the whole point. Repeal the law. It's just a, it just shouldn't exist. It's almost uh, it's almost dangerous that this case will be overturned and then forgotten too quickly. And I know that I mean your comments, both of you have really gone to making sure that the issues more broadly are retained. Yeah. So maybe I'll just close. I mean, I won't summarize everything that's been said, of course. But I just flag four points um, that have emerged just to keep. For the, just to um, so that you, you, you go is remembering um, sort of four important points that emerge from this uh, from the discussion. Um, one is what Peter just said that you know looking at prominent prisoners as a window into looking at, uh, at at abuses that are very common, so that you know that this occasion is really really a, a way to um, shine the light on, on on those broader issues and um, and perhaps even the protests that are coming up and so on as well. Um, and secondly, that. Um, I think one of the important uh, things that emerged is that um, there's also the link, draw, connecting the dots between sort of individual abuses and sort of systemic violations, whether and systemic biases, whether in the media or the judiciary and so on, or structural violence in terms of the broader sort of economic um, economic trajectory, um, which leads to the third point that um, that India shining in some senses may not be um, may not be just a, a contradiction or may not be just it may not be an anomaly, but may, may be in fact something that's an enabling condition of these kinds of abuses and that th those kinds of links may be important to probe. And, um, and fourthly, I guess all the different strategies that people suggested about things one can do, including beginning with signing the postcards as you leave. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you.
because of that. So thank you very much. For We'd just like to uh, thank all four of you for having such a great discussion. And that's a great uh, segue into just making a little more formal announcement about uh, the protest in New York. So as Somnath mentioned, 30th is the Global Day of Action uh, for Binayaksen. And of course, we're trying to use Binayaksen both as representative and as the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, so in New York, on the 28th of this month, which is a Friday, 30th is a Sunday, the, high cons uh, uh, the concert is disclosed. So on Friday, uh, we're going to organize a protest in the afternoon outside the consulate. And it's really, really important that uh, a lot of you turn up. Uh, high numbers are always really, really useful for them to even acknowledge that a protest is happening. They like to see a lot of people to be able to make that acknowledgement. So it would be amazing if a lot of you could turn up on the 28th. If you just sign up, we'll send you announcements about when it's happening. It's 3.30. Uh, it's on the east side in Manhattan. Um, uh, the demands, just so you know, are very clear. Uh, again, segueing from uh, what Minakshi ended with, the three uh, uh, the three main uh, uh, draconian acts that have been passed, CSPSA, UAPA, and the Armed Forces Act as well, uh, as well as the Sedition uh, 124A and the, in the Indian, Indian Penal Code. Those are the four main uh, laws that we are petitioning the High Commission to transmit these demands back to India and say these are the laws that we are uh, really, really concerned about and want repealed. Uh, also, to re the release of Binayak Sen, but not Binayak Sen, only a whole list of uh, uh, people being held in preventive de detention as well as un uh, uh, after being convicted. Uh, that will, again, transmit to you the list that we are uh, agitating for, for uh, to be uh, released. So 28, 330, outside the Indian uh, uh, consulate in Manhattan. It'd be amazing if a lot of you could make it. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you everyone for turning up and thank you yeah, the thank panelists you. for an excellent discussion. Thank you.